Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is Enoch Mianzer Wadwolf, and today we're going to be finishing up a house that we started last week. It was in pretty bad condition, and we did the basement, and now we're going to be going into the kitchen, dining room, and bedroom. Now, one major point to note, while we were doing the basement, the family was upstairs doing the rest of the house, so this was actually cleaned into this condition. The owner's mom actually spent two days in the kitchen, just going through pantries and canned goods and food but as you'll see whenever we get into the thick of this that there was a lot that she just didn't have time to do. So the first thing that we do in any cleanup is we pick an area that's kind of easy and we remove everything off of it. So we're going to just pick one corner of the kitchen, one set of shelves, and we're going to clear off everything and then we're just going to give that a quick wipe down with Mr. Clean. In the process of doing this we're going to make kind of a holding station somewhere else to hold all the extra junk. In this case we're going to use the dining room table to hold all the stuff that like we don't know where it goes. If you start worrying about where to put this stuff right now, you're going to get way overwhelmed because this is not like cleaning a normal house. You're talking about cabinets that are so full that whenever you open the door, all the things inside are flush with where the door used to be. So the whole touch it one time method of cleaning works on a normal everyday house. It does not work on a house like this because we're having to free up space in order to put new stuff. Things don't actually know where they go yet. But once we start freeing up cabinets, then we can start assigning purpose to those cabinets, which I'll go into a little bit later. So you're just gonna have to be patient. I'm not putting up with your impatience, Betty. Betty? Now during this cleanup, some things were confirmed to me that let me know that this is definitely hoarding disorder. And though I'm 90% positive I know the cause of that, or at least one of the major causes of that, I'm not gonna tell that story out of respect for her because she she didn't tell me that story. 90% positive is not positive. And if she didn't talk to me about it herself, it means she doesn't want that to be talked about with everybody else. I can tell you that there were specific things that are hoarded. Food is the biggest. Every single cabinet that has food in it is packed to the point that, that you can't put anything else in there. Outside of that, there's even tubs with even more food in it. Dishes and kitchen gadgets are another. On top of everything that you'll see in here, the basement actually actually has a fully stocked massive set of shelves that are like seven feet tall, completely crammed with kitchen gadgets and dishes. Paper plates, plastic forks and spoons, plastic cups, medication, really, really old medication, spices, and cardboard boxes. These are all things that I find at pretty much every single house that has hoarding disorder. And of course, if you watch the last video, paperwork, we still found massive amounts of paperwork in this house on top of what we'd already found. Almost none of it was still relevant. We're talking about old bills and junk mail from 2006, old bank statements from 2014, just box after box after box of that. That's probably the biggest thing that's cluttering up her bedroom, and it was definitely one of the biggest things cluttering up her basement. When we're cleaning up a place like this, we don't throw away any of that. We just box it up nice and tidy and put it off in the corner. If they want to go through that themselves they're more than welcome to if they don't fine but tossing things that they don't want you to toss is a pretty good way to exacerbate hoarding disorder they will oftentimes panic go through the garbage and retrieve what you've thrown away and it can get worse and the thing is with this case this is kind of a special case because i'm not entirely sure that she's aware that she has hoarding disorder i did however tell her mom and her sister just so that they were aware in case this gets worse or there's a relapse I will tell you that the place was exceptionally clean. Someone asked me on a live the other day if I ever ran into clean hoarder houses, and yes, they're rare, but I do run into them, and this is one of them. There's just an overwhelming amount of stuff, and there are places where she couldn't get to to dust. You'll see that a little bit later, but there was nothing like rotting food or disgusting stuff on the countertops. The stove was really kept clean. It's just that they don't have the space to keep the stuff that they're keeping, and the stuff that they're keeping mostly is is stuff that the average person would have no problem whatsoever getting rid of. So starting a place like this is an issue for most people because they don't know what to do with the stuff. We've already talked about moving things off of a countertop and putting it on like a temporary storage space. And in a lot of these places, there's no like flat surface to do it on. So a lot of times you just have to put that stuff on the floor. We just got lucky in that the dining room table was actually available to put all of it on. However, that space is limited. so. 
very quickly in the cleanup, we have to figure out a way to start putting things back because there's no real way that we can take everything out of the kitchen, clean it, and then put everything back. We would completely hoard the dining room five feet deep in a heartbeat if we did it that way. So what I do is I pick one cabinet that coincides with the nature of the stuff that I just moved. And what I mean by that is a lot of the stuff that we just moved off of this countertop was random household sort of fix it items. Some of it was junk. Some of it was things like, I don't know, tape, some screws, some light bulbs, whatever. Every kitchen that I've been in has one set of cabinets that are devoted for that random type of stuff. So what I do is I open some cabinet doors. I look around and see how she has her kitchen laid out. And then I designate one of those sets of cabinets for that sort of random fix it type junk. I call it junk, but it's really not. So a lot of it is useful items. Anything that's truly junk, we're going to put in a tub and take downstairs to store. Now she had a set of cabinets that were smaller and that's what she was using those for. So what we're going to do is take everything out of that, clean those cabinets up, and then we're going to start meticulously putting stuff back in, in a symmetrical way that is accessible. So on the left hand side, we're going to put light bulbs and I can't even remember what we put in there with it, but it was something useful that you'd use like maybe once every couple months in a house. But we put those together and we put them on the left. Then we found a bunch of rolls of tape that all went together. That's where you're typically going to find small throwaway items like screwdrivers or Allen wrenches or measuring tapes or whatever. This allows us to go through the stuff that we just removed, picked out the most important and put them into that sort of random cabinet set. The stuff that's not really necessary, like I said, is going to be put into a tub and stored downstairs. And as we do that, the giant pile of stuff that we just moved is going to thin itself out and open up more space so that we can go to the next cabinets and do the same thing with those. Now, one thing you're going to notice as we're doing this, some cabinets are going to change purpose as we go, especially in the beginning. This is why I brought up the touch it only once method. In a hoarder house, the cabinets need to have a purpose, otherwise they're just going to get rehoarded. So in other words, you need a cabinet that's just for spices, one that's just for junk, one that's just for cups. As we move around the kitchen, we're going to get a better idea of how much stuff she has, and that's going to kind of dictate which of these cabinets are devoted to what thing. So in the beginning with these small cabinets, I ended up putting spices in one side of it. Then afterwards, I realized that logistically that's a bad idea. The owner of this house is short and it would be a pain for her to reach up there and get those spices. Also, if the spices are in this set of cabinets, you can't see beyond the first row of them to find out what's behind them. So after I put all those spices in, I took them out again because I realized that they would be better in a different cabinet. That is totally fine. When you're dealing with a really cluttered house, there's some trial and error that happens. Once you get that the house into the condition where you know where everything's at and everything has a purpose, then you can use the touch it once method because then you know where things go. Spices go in the spice rack, touch it once, put it away. But trying to do that method in this house in its current condition is impossible. You would have to have like an engineering degree in order to make that happen because by the very nature of the work that we're doing, we have to move stuff out of the way at least once in order to make room for other things to go into the cabinets where those things once existed. And you may find that you get an entire cabinet full and exactly the way that you want it and then realize later, oh, wait a minute, that makes no sense. That's that has to be moved. And you may have to gut that cabinet and start from scratch. That's totally fine. Take your time because in a room like a kitchen, we're not dealing with a lot of decoration. We're dealing with a lot of logistics and we're dealing with functionality. You want to have your spices in an area that doesn't make you walk into another room to get them. You want to be able to reach up from where you're preparing your food and just grab it and right there it is. You also might realize, like we realized, that once we put the spices away, a whole bunch of those were way past their expiration date or best buy date if you're a stickler. Look, once they're out of date by 10 plus years, those two terms don't matter. But those things can be used for up to blah, blah, blah years after they exit. No, 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 no. Shut up. Go buy some new spices, man. They're like two bucks. You do not need to use spices that are a decade out of date. Green beans can last up to 40,000 years if you keep them under the right. No, dude, don't keep green beans for 40,000 years. Buy a new can of green beans. I will personally buy you a new can of green beans if it means getting rid of the 40,000 year old can of green beans. If you haven't eaten those suckers in 10 plus years, you're never going to eat them. Let them 
go, man. Let the beans go. Speaking of which, we found Jello from 2007 in here. Or, well, they expired in 2007, which means it was likely bought at around 2005. So anyway, for this house, what we ended up doing was she had two spice cabinets, and one of them had mostly baking stuff in it, and the other one had mostly, like, regular dinner stuff in it. So we took all the spices out of both of those cabinets. We consolidated them together. We got rid of all the ones that had long past their expiration date and we threw those away. Then we separated them into two categories and I made one cabinet that was for nothing but dinner type spices and I made another cabinet that was nothing but baking stuff. So in that one it's going to be things like cinnamon, nutmeg, sugar, flour, chocolate chips, sprinkles, and then the other one is going to be all the normal stuff you use like for regular everyday cooking. So garlic salt, salt, pepper, canned moose face, paprika, and that makes it a lot easier easier because those cabinets are to the left and the right of the stove. So when she's cooking dinner, she just reaches up to the left for the regular stuff that goes on meat and vegetables. And when she's baking cookies or cakes, she reaches over to the right and that's where all of her baking stuff is. When we got into the cabinet with the dishes, that was a bit difficult because she's overloaded with dishes. So the way I made this work was I restacked the plates and bowls like a Russian doll. So I always start with the biggest plates first, then the medium, then the small. And if you stack those correctly, you can get a whole ton of those into a cabinet. What I wanted to do was get rid of at least half of them because they have about four times too many. But knowing what I know about stacking dishes cabinets, I knew I could make this work. So I did that with the plates and the bowls. Then when I got to the glasses, it was a matter of taking a massive overload of glasses and cups and moving each set of those over and over again until they made sense. And the purpose that I gave each shelf, which beyond just the cabinets having a purpose, each shelf should have a purpose. So in other words, on the left, we got plates on the bottom, smaller plates in the middle, and bowls on the top shelf. In the glasses cabinet, I wanted coffee cups to be on the bottom, drinking glasses to be in the middle, and then anything that looked like it was kind of special I put on top.
but I wanted to try to keep the glasses to just this one section of the cabinet because again, they had way too many. That's why you're gonna see me move a bunch of stuff in it, then take some stuff out, then rearrange, then move some more stuff over, then rearrange because I kept finding more and more and more the further that I reached back into the other cabinet. Eventually what I landed on was I got rid of half their coffee cups and put them into storage. I got rid of at least half of their cups and I found some sets, some drinking glasses that were all the same. So I put those all together and then on the top cabinet I found some specialty things like uh, those little mason jar type drinking glasses that a lot of people in the country like those. Some sets of very large mugs that are used for either soup or gigantic drinks. I found four matching ones so I put those all together on the top shelf too. Then on the right hand side of that cabinet I found a ton of those thermos style drinking mugs that everybody has now. I call them mugs but they're not. Those, those giant water bottle type things. Every hoarder house has an overload of those. I pared those down and, and stored maybe 20% of them because I could make the rest of them fit in the next cabinet but I did pare those down a little bit. Then the last of that was just a couple random hit and miss things but I always leave room in cabinets whenever I'm reorganizing. One thing you're going to want to do if you're reorganizing a really cluttered house like this is don't fill the cabinets as tight as you can fill them with restacked dishes. You're going to be able to come up with a way to restack those to where they look better but if you're not paring things down then you're not able to leave additional room in the cabinets and you're eventually going to need that additional room. So don't just cram these things chock full of dishes until you can't fit any more in them. At some point you're going to have to stop and say that's enough. The way I personally do it is I think if Thanksgiving happened tomorrow would I have enough dishes to serve everyone? I mean I got the moves to serve everyone son. But that's how many dishes I keep is enough to cover Thanksgiving. Everything beyond that needs to find a place that's out of sight, out of mind. Store them in a tub, donate them, put them in a garage sale, something. They do not need to be taking up space in your cabinets. Especially if I pull out a plate and it's completely covered in grease and dust. I know you haven't used that in five to ten years. There is no reason that should be in your cabinets. After we finished with those cabinets, I did a very basic clean out of just the, the countertops. I pulled everything off, wiped it down with Mr. Clean just very quickly. We didn't have to do anything special. And then I stored away anything that was not useful on a daily basis. So there were two blenders. I took those apart and stored them down with her Tupperware because there was plenty of room in that cabinet. She had a small unplugged coffee maker, but she also has a coffee cart in her dining room. So we moved that over to that section. The more room we can make on a countertop the better.
Then once we were done with that, we just went to her very last sort of junk cabinet. Now I call this one junk, but it was more like semi randomness. A lot of what was in this cabinet was meant for baking. So a lot of icing bags and chocolate molds, a few cookbooks here and there, but not all of it was like that. And it was all just kind of smashed in together. So I just pulled it out, wiped everything down the way we did all the other shelves and then stacked things a little bit better and consolidated like-minded things. So all the chocolate bowls got put in a stack together. All the extra baking bowls got put, stacked together like a Russian doll and put back. Any cookbooks got stacked together. And just by doing that, it made everything look a thousand times better and it was more accessible. And again, that's the key to a kitchen cleanup is making things more accessible. I mean, after that, everything else is simple. We just wipe down some countertops, put extra things in whatever place we can find them. Uh, I'm looking at Jason and saying, clean the freaking stove. And he starts crying and I'm like, D don't even cry. You just clean the freaking stove. And I mean, now, now. And he cleans it while sobbing. He's like, I hate you. You hate me all you want. You just clean the stove.
So then once we wrap all that up, we can go into the dining room. And since we've been putting things away as we go, the dining room now becomes infinitely easier to clean because now we're just dealing with a whole section of random stuff that we just have to put together. That one's like the jigsaw puzzle analogy that I make a lot where we're like we're sorting all the blue pieces into one section. Then if we want to get more detailed, we say, OK, th this is blue because it's sky and this is blue because it's blue flowers. So let's separate those into their section. We're going to be doing the same thing when we get to the dining room table, except just with household items. We'll be like, okay, all this stuff here is meant to fix doors. So we'll start a door fixing tub. All this stuff here is old bills. So we'll co consolidate those into a bill pile and put those to the side. Now the bedroom didn't take long to do, but it would have been much, much faster if we didn't have so much paperwork to deal with. In every instance of hoarding disorder, we run into people who keep massive amounts of paperwork. And the thing is, they're always afraid that they're going to throw away something important, which is why I really wish that a lot of them had the ability to sit down with a box of paperwork and go through it and get rid of the stuff that they know to be junk. Now somebody who doesn't have hoarding disorder can do that quickly because we know what a car title looks like and a birth certificate. We typically keep those things separate from all the other unimportant stuff. In hoarding disorder, it all gets lumped together. So the deed to 24 acres of land would just be in some random box of old obsolete bills, which happened in this cleanup on the last video. But in hoarding disorder, there's also often this feeling of if I get rid of this paperwork, what if I need it? What if somebody asks me for it? What if it becomes important because I'm audited or whatever. We know, not having hoarding disorder, that those things never happen. There's never a time when a hospital is going to say, hey, we sent you a bill 14 years ago. We need you to find that bill and bring it in. But in the mind of somebody with hoarding disorder, that is a possibility. And I know that logically, if I find something like an old bill that's stuffed into a box underneath a pile of 15 other boxes or on the floor underneath a pile of 600 pounds, of other garbage. You've already thrown that thing away. It's just that your room has become the garbage can. You haven't seen it in 15 years. You haven't needed it in 15 years. You are never going to need it. So it's easy for me to throw something like that away. But again, when dealing with somebody with hoarding disorder, that can be extraordinarily harmful. It can trigger more hoarding. So the majority of the time in this bedroom was spent consolidating paperwork. And as best we could, we 
we tried to keep the unimportant paperwork in one set of boxes and important sets of paperwork in another set of boxes. And what I considered to be important was anything that could be audited over the course of the last seven years. Beyond seven years, it doesn't matter. They can't audit you back further than that. So even if it was junk mail, if it fell within that seven year period, I put it with potentially important paperwork. Anything that was older than that went into another box. Now you're going to see me rooting through this paperwork and I'm actually not looking to see what the paperwork is for the most part. I mean, again, something important is going to jump out at me like birth certificates, car titles, deeds to lands, insurance policies. Those things just look special. Most of this stuff look like junk mail. And what I'm doing is I'm not looking at what the thing is, I'm looking for dates. And what I typically do is I thumb through and I grab about five pieces of random mail or random receipts in those boxes at different depths. And that can give me a pretty good idea of how old the paperwork is as a whole. So anytime you see me stopping and like pouring over a piece of paperwork, all I'm doing is looking for the date. Then I find four or five more of those throughout the box, verify that they're all old. Then I can hand the box to Jason and say, put this downstairs. And I mean now. And then he starts crying. He's like, I don't want it. I just don't, don't cry. Just put it downstairs. God, I'm sick of his crap. So the process for this room is much the same way that we did the kitchen and dining room. We're going to make the bed first so that everything is flat. And then we're going to use the bed as a temporary storage space. Then one at a time, we're going to start taking tubs and boxes that she already has packed up, put them on the bed, and then very quickly go through them to see if we can consolidate other things into those tubs. So an example of that would be if she has a tub with nothing but craft supplies in it, I'm going to find more craft supplies and put it into that tub. Over the course of this whole house cleanup, we found maybe 100 or 200 pictures. So I created a tub for nothing but those. Books go in one, random electronics go into another. She saves every box from everything she's ever bought. Some of those boxes are really old and no longer necessary. Some of those boxes are somewhat new and could potentially be necessary, even though I personally feel that once you've gotten a, an electronic thing and it's worked for a couple weeks, just toss the box, man. Two areas that we're not going to clean in this room, or, or I keep saying cleaning, we're more organizing than anything. I never clean under someone's bed and I never clean their dresser drawers or nightstand drawers. We are two males cleaning a female's room. I do not want to accidentally uncover something that's going to embarrass her. And and I don't mean her specifically. 90% plus of the people I've helped have been women. Somewhere in that room is going to be something they don't want me to see and I'm not going to throw myself into those areas. The drawers are a private place in my eyes and even though the bed is typically a place where people just shove crap underneath it, in the early days of me doing this I have found some things underneath a bed and because I've cleaned underneath there she will know once she gets back home that oh my god he cleaned underneath there and he definitely saw my moose themed wrestling costume. Now he knows my alter ego and now I have to do something about it. And I don't want to wrestle anyone man. I've got stuff to do. There is a tub and a set of boxes right in front of her closet that's all diabetic stuff. Those are staying exactly where they were. If there's one thing I don't want to be responsible for it's for losing insulin and the delivery methods thereof. That stuff is so important I want them to be able to find that in their sleep with the lights off so it's not getting moved even one inch. I'd like to take a second to address a question that I get multiple times every week, which is somebody says, hey, I found this Facebook page. Is this yours? And I usually say in most videos where my Facebook page is, the only Facebook page that I have is linked in the description of my videos. It's also linked in like the about section of the YouTube channel, but I have one Facebook page and it's linked right here. If it's not linked on this page or in the description of the video. It's not mine. For those who don't know, I have a members only section. There's three tiers. As always, if you can't afford stuff like this, please, for the love of God, don't become a member. It's just an extra thing that you can do to help support the channel financially. And both Jason and I are doing fine financially. This just helps pay for some of the stuff that we often pay for. In other channel news, uh, when 
when am I going to do my next collaboration with Clean With Barbie? I've talked to her and we're going to try to set something up for this summer. She said that's whenever she has the, the most time and is the most available. So I'm just going to pay for her ticket to fly her out here. We have a guest room so she doesn't have to worry about hotels and food and all that stuff. So I'll give you a better idea of the date once we know, but I would say in general, probably this summer. When are we going to have our stuff for sale online, our cleaning supplies? I've had the cleaning supplies for several months and about the time we were getting ready to start posting that online, that's whenever we found out that Emily needed multiple surgeries. She's already been through one. She has another one that's going to be coming up soon. Once she's through those surgeries, then we will start posting things on a new website and we're going to do it much like Detail Geek where he sells his own products. That way I can control what we're selling. I can say these are the things I actually use in the videos because they're the best of the best. I'll be selling not only individual products, but I'll also be selling cleaning kits and probably multiple levels of cleaning kits that have more advanced stuff the higher price range you go. But before any of that can happen, Emily needs to get through her next surgery and have plenty of time to heal because she's going to be the one who sets up the website and starts taking the initial orders. I really, really want to get that stuff going as soon as possible, but we also can't add additional stress right before she has literal brain surgery. She's got a pituitary adenoma that she has to have removed. It's a small tumor on her pituitary gland. She's been through that once before, so she knows what to expect, but it's not exactly just a run-of-the-mill surgery. I'm also having a minor surgery in the next month to attach a third arm to the middle of my chest, and that's just so that I can use my hands when I talk and so that I can clean efficiently while still holding a cell phone. I'm also having an additional arm removed that's currently in the middle of my back, and that's just because it's silly. I'm not putting up with silly arms. I'm not putting up with it. Another common question I keep getting, I keep answering it on videos, but I have to remember not everyone watches every video, and that's, have you given up on doing like super dirty houses? And the answer is no. The last few houses that we done just happened to be clean, but they needed help nonetheless, so we did our thing with them. As of this week, I'm currently looking for another place to do, another person to help, and I really want to do one that requires some heavy duty cleaning. Because keep in mind, this has never really been about content. I started making content for YouTube for myself. I just wanted to see cleaning in fast motion in time lapse, which is why all my earlier videos don't have narration because I was just making the videos for myself. So I never look at a house and think this is going to make great content. I look at a house and say that's going to satiate my desire, my autistic itch for doing this hobby. And it's going to help somebody who desperately needs help but can't afford for some cleanup crew to come in and, and charge her $10,000 for the cleanup. And this one's really important because I get hundreds of messages per week from people asking me, can you come to Pennsylvania? Can you come to California? I've got a place in Texas that needs cleaned up. Can you come and help us out? I only do this locally right now. I find so many places locally because it's virtually an epidemic here. Eventually we will be traveling, but whenever I do the traveling stuff, I will announce it here on YouTube and on Facebook. So unfortunately right now the answer is no, I can't travel to do these, but that will change in the future. Also, if you do happen to be local, I only do these cleanups if the person who owns the house says that I can and asks me for the help. So what I get a whole lot of is my sister-in-law's house is completely trashed. I've been trying to help her for years. Can you come in and do this? And the issue is that if you've been trying to help her for years and she doesn't trust you with it, she's definitely not going to trust a full-blown stranger to come in and do the same thing. My suggestion is to show them the videos so that they can see what I do. Show them that it's not a scam, that I'm not going to charge them, that I keep everybody anonymous. And then if they see those and they like what they see and they're comfortable with it, then they can contact me. And the best place to do that would either be via email or even better through Facebook Messenger. And they can tell me I'm ready for help. I'm ready to let you do what you need to do. If I don't have that question, if I don't have that sort of permission, then what's going to happen is I'm going to show up to the house and I'm going to be spinning my wheels and headbutting with the person over small things that are insignificant to me and extraordinarily important to the owner of the house, like old newspapers and magazines. Yes, I do know a lot about the psychology of hoarding disorder and ADHD, but I'm not a therapist. So my, I, I talk about this a lot on the videos to educate people on what hoarding disorder is. But my job whenever I get to those houses 
is, is pretty simple. It's just to clean up the house and make it livable again. As always, thanks for watching. Members, I will see you this Wednesday. And everyone else, I'll see you next weekend. Later.